Hi, everybody. Good afternoon and welcome to our travel trivia fundraiser to support our in-country guys. Uh, we're really excited that you're joining us to try something a little bit different today and uh, all for a good cause. Before we get started, I'll just go over a quick note on the technology side of things. You can find your Zoom control panel at the bottom of your screen uh, where you can manage your audio and your display settings. Microphones have been muted and video has been disabled for everyone except our panelists today. We'll also be using an app called Kahoot for the actual gameplay, uh, which I'll explain a little bit more about in just a moment. But if you're planning to play along and everyone has the option of playing if you'd like, you don't have to. If you'd prefer to just watch, that's totally okay too. But if you're planning to play for the best experience, we do recommend possibly using two devices if you're able, one to watch and one to play. Uh, so, for example, you might want to have Zoom open on your computer and then have a phone or a tablet available uh, for the gameplay on Kahoot. And that way you're not having to ta uh, toggle back and forth on a single screen. Um, if you do only use one device, a uh, computer screen is probably your best bet. That way you can have both windows open on your computer screen uh, side to side. And if you are only able to join from your phone or tablet, that's totally fine too. Uh, you'll just want to keep the Zoom app running in the background for audio, and then you can keep the Kahoot app open so that you can view it on your main screen to play. Uh, so we still have just a few minutes before we start the actual gameplay. So if you want to make any adjustments to your devices or your screens, um, you do have a few moments to make those adjustments, uh, grab a second device, whatever you'd like to do. Uh, also being somewhere with a strong internet connection is probably going to be helpful. And in the spirit of the game, we do ask that you use the honor system. Uh, obviously, we can't stop anybody from a quick Google on the side, but the idea is for this to be fun and uh, hopefully enjoy testing your knowledge. So uh, in just a moment, I'll turn it over to Andrea Holbrook, and she'll set the stage and tell us a little bit more about what we're going to be doing today and why. And she'll also introduce our guests. Uh, then we'll walk through instructions for the Kahoot interface together. Before we kick off the game, our host, David Blackburn, will explain the format of the game itself and the different kinds of questions that you can expect, and then we'll start playing. At the end, we'll get a chance to see our high scores and award prizes, and then we'll wrap up with some final announcements. So we hope you can stick around to the end. Uh, we may run over the hour just a little bit, but we're going to try to keep things moving as much as possible. So for those of you who don't know Andrea Holbrook, uh, she joined the Holbrook Travel Team in 1993 and has been the president and CEO since 1998. In addition to her role at Holbrook, she also supports the work at Selva Verde Lodge and Rainforest Reserve in Costa Rica. Andrea also serves on the advisory boards of several organizations, including the Sarapaki Conservation Learning Center and the Center for Responsible Travel, among others. Uh, fun fact about Andrea, her first trip to the Galapagos Islands was at the age of five when she traveled on a converted military vessel. Uh, so right now I'll turn it over to Andrea. Andrea, hi, welcome. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here and to have you all uh, with us on this exciting trivia event. Um, I was given this idea actually by one of our um, clients and really since that time have been contacted over the months since the pandemic began uh, by many, many um, clients who have expressed their concern, not only about Holbrook at this time in the pandemic, but really the entire um, you know, field, um, the guides especially that we work with since they are really the face of, of our destinations and the ambassadors to our destinations. Um, and like, like each of you at home who have um, built relationships, um, in some cases over a period of years uh, with group leaders, um, we are, you know, hopeful that um, through this event and um, also through our calendar, which Lindsay will tell you a little bit more about at the end, um, to just send them a little bit of support. Um, obviously, it can't offset the kind of income loss that they've suffered um, since March, but um, I think every little bit counts. And I know that just knowing that they're in our thoughts is, is really the spirit of, of this and, and hopefully what we can achieve. So I just really want to thank all of you for your time today and for playing along with us and having some fun. Um, and I'd like to thank all of our panelists. So um, without further ado, we can move on to, um, so first of all, um, this wouldn't be possible without uh, Dave uh, Blackburn. Um, he's the curator of herpetology at the Florida Museum of Natural History. Um, um, 
incredible work um, overseeing the um, collection of amphibians and reptiles um, among the top 10 in the United States. Um, uh, published in National Geographic Science Magazine and many other uh, publications um, and um, holds a PhD from Harvard University um, as well as um, University of Chicago um, and has done field work throughout Africa. Um, and um, we were very fortunate to meet Dave um, when he started his work here at the at the museum and have um, had the great fortune of planning trips to Tanzania and an exciting uh, uh, museum summer camp for families in the rainforest uh, at our site at uh, Selva Verde. Um, he did a fabulous um, introduction to iNaturalist uh, when actually when the pandemic first began in our very first webinar. Um, and we're very lucky to have uh, Dave with us here. So thank you so much, Dave. Um, would also like to do, introduce our own Andrea Chaverri, who is our product development um, specialist um, and the director of our operations, our office in Costa Rica. Um, so um, Andrea Chaverri um, hails from, obviously from Costa Rica, has a background steeped in tourism, uh, got her start uh, working in student and educational tourism, and really has continued in that uh, field here with us at Holbrook. Um, recently, a new mom to a beautiful baby, Lucia. So thanks. Thanks so much, Andrea. Next, um, is um, our hybrid, Felipe de la Torre, I call him hybrid because um, uh, from Ecuador, hailing from Ecuador, but um, in, in a way, uh, a Gainesvillian like many of us uh, here in the Holbrook office. He actually studied here high school and went to high school with my older sister, Cornelia, um, and then attended Santa Fe College with a degree in anthropology. But um, little did I know as a 12 year old um, that I would be working very closely with Felipe who is our uh, partner in Ecuador. And he also in um, 2014 founded a beautiful uh, lodge in Isabella Island in Galapagos called Scalicia. So welcome Felipe, thank you so much for joining thank us. Thank you, Andrea. <laughs> Try not to tell any stories about me in this, okay. okay. Um, <laughs> And um, Horacio Cavilli, um, whom we have also a very deep history, joins us from Buenos Aires. Um, we have been working with Horacio as an expert uh, guide in front, you know, guiding all kinds of programs in Patagonia and the Southern Cone, both in Argentina and Chile. Um, as I said, he hails from Buenos Aires, um, has a veterinary uh, background and actually lived in Scandinavia, multilingual, and just a real passion for both his native Argentina and really um, travel and the world in general. So thank you so much, Horacio, for uh, joining us for this event. So without further ado, um, I will uh, be turning it over to, um, to, I believe, to Lindsay now, who's going to get us started with, um, with Kahoot. Yes, thank you, Andrea. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, as Andrea said, I'll quickly go over the mechanics of Kahoot, which is what we're using to play today. Um, again, everyone who's joining us is eligible to play. So if you'd like to, um, to play along, um, we can do that through Kahoot. Uh, if you already happen to have Kahoot, uh, the app downloaded on your mobile device, great. You can go ahead and open it up now. If not, no problem. You don't need to download anything. Um, instead, what you're going to do is go to kahoot.it. That's K-A-H-O-O-T dot I-T. Uh, you can see that on the screen there. Um, you'll open that up on your mobile device or another browser window on your computer. When you get to Kahoot dot I-T, it will ask you for a six-digit uh, uh, six code called a game pin. And um, we're going to go ahead and bring that up on the screen right now as well. Um, the game pin is 414-8240. And I'm also just gonna put that in the chat real quick for everyone as well, so that uh, if you'd like to um, copy and paste that into your browser, uh, hopefully that'll make that a little bit easier for you as well. And looks like we've already got some people joining, so that's great. Um, so yeah, so once you enter that game pin, you'll be asked to enter uh, your name. Uh, after you uh, complete those two screens, you'll be ready to go. 
Um, your name will show up in the lobby. Again, as you can see, we've got some people uh, already uh, uh, showing up here in the lobby. So uh, again, your name will show up there as well. And then once we officially start the game, your device will automatically follow along. Uh, you'll have time for each question to select the correct answer on your device. And Dave will read the questions aloud. Our panelists will give their own answers aloud. And you'll see that there's a timer on the left-hand side of the screen. And once the timer runs out, we'll reveal the correct answer. Uh, and your device will progress to the next question when we do. Uh, Kahoot will automatically keep score. You don't have to do anything on that side. And if you answer faster, your points will increase. So uh, again, the questions are timed. And um, so get those answers locked in as quickly as you can. Um, if you know, if you think you know it. Um, so now I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our host extraordinaire, David Blackburn. David, welcome. Great. Hello, everybody. It's uh, it's great to see already some familiar faces or at least names on the attendee list for today, including people I've traveled with as part of Holbrook. So welcome, everyone. It's great to have everyone here. Um, first off, we're going to just quickly meet uh, the panelists that you'll be playing alongside today. So. So first we have uh, Felipe from Ecuador. Uh, welcome, great to see you here. Felipe, I think you're on mute. Sorry about that. Thank you, David. It's also great, uh, great to be here. Thank you so much. Excellent. Next we have uh, Horatio from Argentina. Hello, Thanks Dave. for being here. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It's very nice to be here from sunny Buenos Aires. We have 77. Paddy Hay today and Sunny. So I'm <laughs> waiting for you. Wonderful. And last but not least, we have Andrea from Costa Rica. I'm glad you're able to be here with us. Hello, everyone. I'm very happy, very excited to be here, to be part of this webinar and trivia. Um, I'm right now in San Jose, Costa Rica. So welcome, everyone. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. So let me tell you what we're going to do uh, during our time together. So for those of you that are uh, are here. Hopefully many of you are playing along, although some of you are just watching. Um, but those playing along will be in Kahoot as was just explained. And so for each part of the game today, I'm going to read a question and the answers that will appear on your screen. And after each question, you'll see the correct answers shown up there. Or after each question, after it's done, then you'll see the correct answer revealed. As we go along, we'll see tallies of the scores of those of you playing. Uh, for those playing at home on Cahoots, you'll be playing alongside our distinguished panelists who are also trying to answer the questions about many places around the world. And uh, many of these questions are from countries from which the guides that Holbrook uh, works with uh, come. And in this case, that's actually guides today from uh, more than, I think, 15 different countries around the world. So first, we're going to be doing a series of multiple choice questions, these panel questions. Uh, where you, the listener, select your answer on Cahoots and our panel plays along trying to figure out the answer with you. Next, we will play Bluff the Listener. Each of our panelists is going to tell you a story from their respective countries, and those playing along on Cahoots will have, a ch have to choose which of these stories actually happen. For those of you that have traveled a lot to other countries, uh, you know that sometimes you hear stories while you're traveling that are awfully hard to believe uh, based on your experience back home. And last, we're going to play a rapid paced lightning round where you will play along with each of our panelists as they answer trivia questions around about places uh, in different parts of the world. Um, and just as you see on the screen, there's times the panel questions, you will have 60 seconds to uh, select the question, the correct answer. Whereas in the lightning round will be half, this, uh, half the time where you'll only have 30 seconds to pick your answer. And so that's what we'll be doing here today. All right, looks like we have a good group of people here that are uh, ready. Oh, and away we go. So which of the following statements about the platypus is false? Males have venomous spurs on their hind legs. Uh, platypuses don't have stomachs. They can, they can locate prey by sensing electrical impulses or that they're the only mammals to lay eggs. Which of these are true? Platypus, for reference, is an Australian mammal. When it was first discovered, people just did not believe that it was actually a real animal. It just looks so ridiculous. Have any, have any of our panelists seen one uh, in life? 
looks like a duck, I guess. No, really. I've never. Seen one. <laughs> never. <laughs> never, never, but it does look like a duck. Duck with hair. All right, nice. Yes, yeah. the correct answer here uh -huh. this is a good one to get going on. The correct answer was that they're the only mammals that lay eggs. Uh, so these are monotremes, they're, uh, like some other, um, uh, just a few other species in the world for mammals uh, that, that lay eggs found in Australia or uh, parts of New Guinea. All right, so that gives us a taste of what this is going to be like. All right, next up. Ooh, all right, it's a tight race already. Second question. Which movie featured Tikal as a filming place? Was it James Bond, The Spy Who Loved Me, Apocalypse Now, Star Wars Episode Four, or Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom? Any of our panelists have a guess on this one? Mm. Indiana Jones, I guess. Sounds like an Indiana Jones place to me. I feel like Indiana Jones is a good guess. Any, yes, any other ideas, so. people? Indiana Jones, yeah. Okay, but I have no idea, but I will say Indiana Jones just in case. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be peer pressured, uh, Horacio. Just <laughs> Star Wars, no, it doesn't look. Like it. Yeah, <laughs> it doesn't look like Star Wars and no. Apocalypse, I don't think so. Oh, I think you're going to be surprised. I only knew where one of these was filmed, actually. So it surprised me, actually, with this particular answer. All right, let's see. We're almost ready. Wow. And the correct answer was episode four, A New Hope, uh, which was also filmed partly in Tunisia, but I guess part of it was also filmed in, uh, in Tikal. Uh, fun fact, it was a James Bond movie filmed in Tikal, but it wasn't this one. It was Moonraker. For those of you that know that mm -hmm. one. Moonraker. I think that's the theme song. All right. Next up, the name lemur derived from the Latin word lemures, which roughly translates to wandering ghost, one who flies, long-limbed, or cat monkey. Lemurs, of course, are a group of primates that are found only in Madagascar. Any guesses from our panelists here? From Latin, I don't see any link. I'm wondering, but I don't think it's a wandering ghost. Uh, so, so the name lemur actually comes from, it was given to them by uh, the famous taxonomist, Carl Linnaeus, who of course never saw one of these things alive because he was living in Sweden at the time. I would say cat monkey, just because it's it looks like a combination of a cat and a monkey. <laughs> I feel like that's a pretty solid guess here. Yeah, I'll go for that one. Too. Yeah, cat monkey. Cat monkey. Okay. And the answer is actually wandering <laughs> ghost. I actually don't know what inspired Linnaeus to pick a particular name. The, uh, that was a surprise to me. All right. That's a good one. Mm -hmm. Next up. This is a good one, actually. What was unusual about Halliburton's Panama Canal Transit? So Richard Halliburton in 1928 transited the canal. Was it that he swam the entire length of the canal, paddled the canal in a dugout canoe, rode down the canal in an oak barrel, or captained the first passenger ship down the canal? Trying to see if in the picture it shows what he's doing. Uh, yeah, I don't think so, actually. <laughs> Color photograph. But the, uh, so it actually turned out that uh, he was the lowest ever person to pay a toll on the Panama Canal. And he normally, when ships go through, they can pay you know, upwards of a million dollars. But Halliburton actually only paid 36 cents for his toll on the canal. Well, that's a good clue. I would say he paddled in, in a canoe for that money. It's a small boat. Yeah, I like that. Oh, yeah, barrel might be smaller, though. <laughs> yeah, well, much harder. Uh, yeah, I think he paddled it. Maybe he'd be aged. Me well. too. I think he paddled. Actually, he swam wow. the entire <laughs> length of the canal <laughs> over a ten-day <laughs> period. It took him fifty hours over a ten-day period, but and they only charged him thirty-six cents, which I guess was probably somehow related to his own. Weight. But they did charge him. I mean, they charged him. They said, "Well, of course, you're still going to you know collect a toll. Why not?" <laughs> All right. Which of these animals is not closely related to the other three? Hyraxes, the small mammal. These are all mammals, by the way. Manatees are also dugongs that live in the ocean. Elephants or tapirs? 
This is a hard one, actually. Any guesses, panelists? Elephants and tapirs looks uh, very related. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what a hyraxis is. is. Is that a kind of buck or a deer? Uh, it is. Uh, it looks like a rodent, but isn't a rodent. Uh, oh. You find it in rocks and actually sometimes trees in uh, parts of East Africa and Central mm -hmm. Africa. So hyraxes are mostly mammals. So, wow. Okay. Yeah, so it turns out hyraxes, manatees, and elephants are all part of a radiation of mammals that are from Africa. Uh, and tapirs are actually more wow. closely related to things like horses and rhinoceros. It's pretty cool. Nice. Wow. All right. These are tricky, by the way, whoever put these questions together. All right, here we go. This, uh, this is a good one. What does Machu Picchu uh, in Peru translate to in English? Temple of the Stars, Green Fortress, Place to Look Down, or Old Mountain? Mm, I would say, say Old Mountain or Green Fortress. Andrea, what were you saying? I would say Temple of the Stars. Well, I feel like this is a good one. Green Fortress, I think, is correct. Green Fortress. Yeah, this is uh, Machu Picchu, of course, is one of the most recognizable remnants of the mighty Inca Empire, uh, which spanned much of South America. Uh, and this, the site name, uh, Machu Picchu, actually comes from the indigenous uh, Quechua language. There is a, another mountain nearby with Old similar mountain. names. So. Old Mountain is okay. actually the, the correct answer here. And I guess if everybody answers, then we just automatically move on. Is that, is that correct, what's happening, I think? Okay. <laughs> Old Mountain, oh, you're doing well there, Sarah. The exterior <laughs> of the Taj Mahal in India is primarily constructed out of what material? Ivory, marble, concrete, or limestone? I imagine it would be something luxurious. Yes, it is. White and shiny. Marble? I marble? Think. I, marble? Think I would say is. marble. Yeah. Sounds to me. I feel like this is a good guy. It took over 20,000 people to actually construct the Taj Mahal over a very long period of time and involved more than a thousand elephants. Which I, I imagine uh, there's not that many wow. elephants employed in construction. So many today. So I think, did everybody go with marble on this? I think yes. I do. I this time uh, we're correct. And it was yeah. right. Finally. <laughs> nice. No one was fooled by concrete. Good job, panel. I think that was the first time we've gotten out of right. I see you have uh, some followers there. <laughs> Sarah. Oh, maintaining a healthy lead. All right. A popular attraction near could Oh. Alaska's Miles, sorry, Alaska's Miles Glacier Bridge was damaged in 1964 by what phenomenon? An earthquake, volcanic eruption, a flood, or a rogue iceberg? So the Glacier Bridge is near Cordova, Alaska, and crosses the Copper River. What damaged this bridge in 1964? I just can guess that the flood, if it is a bridge, I like the idea of a rogue iceberg, personally. A uh, rogue iceberg, OK. Yes, I will say it a rogue iceberg. Oh, great. All right, I've got Andrea, at least. Yeah. I'll, I'll go for <laughs> I will uh, say. Yeah, I'll go, I'll go along with the rogue iceberg. Iceberg. I, I don't think there'd be any iceberg major rogue. volcanic eruptions. Wow. And the answer was an oh, earthquake. Oh, there was an which... earthquake. <laughs> nice. We may have some people from Alaska participating. That's true. <laughs> Holbert participants everywhere. All right, this next one actually has a tie-in specifically to Holbrook. What year did scientists discover first discover that monarch butterflies winter in sanctuaries in Mexico? 1911, 1975, 1958, or 1996? I'm sure it was in the 1900s. You Great have. one, Horacio. Well, That's really good. Yeah, Horacio, good one. <laughs> okay, I go for 1911. 1911? 1958. 1958. 1975. All right. Yeah. These are good guesses. So Holbrook long had a collaboration with Tom Emmel, uh, who recently <laughs> passed away. And yes, it was 1975. So surprisingly recently, and Holbrook has actually guided a lot of wow that have gone to Mexico specifically to see the monarch migration 
at first with uh, Tom Emmel, but now with uh, people from the Florida Museum like Jared Daniels. All right, I'm glad so many people got that right. It's surprisingly recent. All right, this is our last one of this section. Which of these animals can you find in Antarctica? Polar bears, walruses, Humboldt penguins, or leopard seals? No bears in the southern hemisphere. Mm -hmm. No. There are a lot of penguins, but other species. Walruses are those that with the long teeth, and they are in the north also. So leopard seals. Oh, race sure. Sure. Excellent process of elimination <laughs> there. <laughs> Others? Nice. Ooh. Nice. Nailed it. Nice work. Ooh, yes, a lot of penguins, good. but not Humboldt penguins. But not Humboldt. All right, well, that was the conclusion of our first section. That was pretty fun. I enjoyed that. Next up, Great we are job, going. Guys. Next up, we are going to. Uh, do we get a tally of how people are doing right now, or do we uh, just move on to the next section? I think we might need to just go on to the next section. All right, moving on. <laughs> we might get so, one after the bluff the listener. <laughs> all right, so this is a good one. This is bluff the listener. So. Each of our panelists is going to read a story. That same story will appear on your screen so you can read along. After all three of them are done, then we're going to move to another screen where you can select one of the three answers that you think is the correct, true story. All right, I think we're ready to go. So first up, we have Andrea's story from Costa Rica. Okay. So before Corcovado National Park required visitors to have a certified local guide, it was common to hear funny stories about tourist mishaps. This particular one came from a US traveler and his son who visited in the 1980s. Stopping to rest, the hikers watched two baby capybaras cross the trail. Suddenly, loud crashing sounds and barks emerged from the woods. Grabbing the nearest baby, the hikers ran while passing the squealing rodent back and forth like in a rugby game. After tossing the baby capybara into some bushes, they scrambled up to trees. The hikers were relieved to see that the baby, now with, with its mama, appeared to be uninjured. All right, so that's our first story. Uh, Capybaras from Costa Rica. Next is Felipe's story from the Galapagos in Ecuador. Okay, every year tourists from around the world flock to the Galapagos Islands to see the volcanic landscape, weird animals and abundant marine life in this archipelago. Among all of the incredible life forms found in the Islas Encantadas, none as unique as the little known as the pink iguana. No joke, in addition to having the world's only marine iguana, the Galapagos also have a big species living at Wall Volcano on Isabella Island. The rosy lizards feed, feed on the fruit of the cactus leaves and they look a lot like Galapagos land iguanas. Maybe Susan Komen and the Charles Darwin Foundation should collaborate in promoting awareness of conservation efforts and breast cancer research after all. What better symbol for this joint endeavor than an endangered, piece, uh, endangered pink iguana? Pink iguanas in the Galapagos? Mm. You'll never know. And next, we have our final of the three, Horacio's story from Argentina. Yes, Argentina's Peninsula Valdez is an important breeding area for a variety of shorebirds and marine mammals, including southern right whales, orcas, elephant seals, and Magellanic penguins. Roberto Bubas, a park ranger at Punta Norte, has spent over a decade observing resident orcas. During beach patrol or while kayaking, he noticed that wild orcas tended to swim, vocalize, and spy hop nearby. One evening, Roberto played his flute at the beach an orcas tried to mimic the notes. Eventually, they learned to accompany him in song and harmonize, and even slapped their tails and appeared to dance in time to the music. This 
incredible findings are now part of a larger study being conducted by marine biologists at the Peninsula Valdez Orca Research Institute. Wow. I feel like that's... Uh, I, I could... think I read something about that or, I or I, read, I was dreaming probably. <laughs> or will happen in the future. All right, so we have, we have our three stories here um, and you are voting on which one is true. Uh, so just as a reminder, that is Andrea's story about tourists being chased down by capybaras at the forest of Costa Rica, Felipe's on the discovery of pink iguanas from the Galapagos Islands of Ecuador, and Horatio's about orcas harmonizing with beachside flute playing in Argentina. Which of these is true? I had an unfair advantage. I actually knew the answer to this one right, right from the get-go. <laughs> Oh. You and the iguana knew. Oh, yes. Nice. Actually, many people yeah, got that yeah. one. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. So actually, there was recently described a new species of iguana uh, that's terrestrial from the Galapagos Islands that is often uh, pink, which is uh, pretty cool. Wonderful. All right. Well, that was uh, that was pretty good. Let's see our scores. All right, people Sarah are Sarah is well. just keeping up in the lead here. Sarah and Adam, Sarah and Adam, it's Go pretty cool. They're neck and neck. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. All right, well, now we're going to go to our fast paced round. Let me, hold on, don't start it yet. I gotta get ready because I gotta, gotta do some like uh, mouth gymnastics to make sure that I'm, I'm ready to speak this quickly. All right. <laughs> <laughs> And just for fun, I really like that you you threw in words that were difficult to pronounce into the lightning round. So it's, it's really keeping me on my toes at this point. I All right, I am ready. If our panelists uh, ready, so first, what we're going to do: each panelist is going to get um, five questions, and we're going to start off with Andrea. You are up first. So the first five, Andrea, okay. these are all yours. All right. Here we go. Which of these is the best description of the geothermal activity called Yokulap, a volcanic mud flow, a fast moving current of hot gas, ash, and rocks, an outburst flood from a subglacial lake, or slow moving lava flows? All right. Yokulap. Um. <laughs> I will say if it's geothermal, so it uh, has to be with a fast moving current of hot gases, ash and rock. I like that. Wow, look how many people wow. got that one right. I really, <laughs> wow. Good work, everybody. Wow. That one really threw me when I saw that one. <laughs> Excellent. All right, here's one that's gonna be a little bit closer to home, I think. <laughs> Kui is a delicacy in the Andean Highlands. What is it? Chinchilla? Andean condor, alpaca, or guinea pig? Guinea pig. Guinea pig, of course, uh, common across Peru. Wow. All right. That wasn't even hard. That was an easy one. That was a gimme. Yeah. All right. All right. Especially this, in the Holbrook audience. For everyone. I like it. All right. This one's a little trickier. All right. Which of these species is not endemic? and only found in the Galapagos Islands. So endemic means only found there. Is it the flightless comera, the marine iguana, the Galapagos tortoise, or the blue-footed booby, which is not found only there? Um, the marine iguana? It's a blue-footed oh. booby. Blue booby. You should have asked me that one. It can fly, it actually can fly. So you can find it in other places, it turns out. That's a good one. Holbrook started, uh, you know, going to the Galapagos early on, and it actually was the, I think, the very first trip that Giovanna Holbrook led. Yes, uh, yeah. was to the Galapagos in the 1970s. It's pretty cool. All right, two more. It's a good. This is a good one, actually. In 1893, New Zealand became the first country to do what? Grant women the right to vote, implement daylight savings time, give constitutional protection to the natural environment or establish a social security program? I think all of these seem plausible to me. Okay, I will say give constitutional protections to the natural environment. 
certainly it's a country that today is well known for for doing a lot. Oh, it's a, oh, granted women the right to vote. Woohoo! Ninety three <laughs> certainly beat out uh, this country. Okay. <laughs> All right, this was one um, that I did not know the answer to. Uh, so I was, this is great. Which of these countries has three capital cities? Bolivia, South Africa, mm. India, or the United States? Ooh. Hmm. Tough one. This is because Tough it's one. in different parts of its government between, in different places. Yeah, India or South Africa. Uh, Oh, <laughs> South, South Africa. Africa. Yeah, so it actually turns yeah. out its executive branch is in Pretoria, uh -huh. judicial branch is in Bloemfontein, and its legislative branch is in Cape Town, which actually yeah. I've worked in Africa for 20 years, and I didn't actually know that about South Africa. <laughs> I haven't worked in South Africa. There you go. That's good. All right. Hey, that was pretty good. Good work. Let's see All the right. scores. Oh, Adam has snuck ahead here. Oh. Nice. <laughs> All right. So next up, our next player for five questions is Felipe. Are you ready, okay. Felipe? Yes. Give him to him. All right, here Give we go. This is, a, this is a good one. Which of the following is not a Christmas tradition in Iceland? A visit from the 13 Yule lads, uh, lighting candles on a special candelabra, leaving shoes on the windowsill for gifts, or decorating an Icelandic pony with tinsel? Oh my God. Okay, <laughs> that's, that's very easy. Um, What's your guess here? You better go quick. No, I know. Uh, leaving shoes. Are you at Louis leaving shoes? Is a good guess. Yeah. Turned out it was uh, decorating an Icelandic pony with tinsel is not a real tradition. Hmm. All right, next up. This will be a little closer to home. Which of the following countries recognizes the resplendent Quetzal as its national bird? Is it Guatemala? Honduras, Costa Rica, or Panama? Costa I know Andrea Rica. knows the answer. Costa Rica. I know the answer. <laughs> you might know the answer because it's not Costa Rica. I don't know. It's not. <laughs> oh, oh, she just gave me a hit. Oh. <laughs> uh, thank you, Andrea. Guatemala. <laughs> she really threw you off. Good work, Andrea. All right. <laughs> All right, dating back at least 55 million years, which of these is the world's oldest desert? Is it the Baja California Desert in Mexico, the Namib Desert in Namibia, the Atacama Desert in Chile, or the Antarctic Desert? Desert. So it turns out, of course, there's not a lot of rain in Antarctica and it's very dry. So Antarctica is also a large desert. But which is the oldest desert? Nambi uh, Namibia. Namib. Sorry, you got no. it right, as did uh, most people here. Nice work. All right, let's see. We have two more here. All right, there's a tricky one. Uladva is a settlement in Argentina's Chubut province noted for its many speakers of which language? German, Welsh, Sicilian, or Yiddish? Uh, maybe a good clue is the spelling of Uladva. Okay. Yiddish. Yiddish? <laughs> All right, let's see uh, what everybody has settled on here. Welsh is the correct Welsh. answer. But many people were split with Yiddish too. Nice. Yeah. Horacio could have told you that, uh, Felipe. Yeah. You should have cheated. I was expecting you to send me a, a WhatsApp Time. message. Or a... <laughs> Terrible. Want a friend, quickly. All right, here's your last one, Felipe. Almost all mammals have the seven vertebrae in their neck. Which of these does not have seven vertebrae? Whales, bats, sloths, or giraffes? The tricky one. Mm. I would say bats, but I have no clue. Bats? Good, <laughs> good Honesty is the best policy. Oh, sloths. The sloths. Turns out, weirdly, yeah. I knew that. Animals, including <laughs> giraffes, which have very long necks, they still only have seven vertebrae, just like we do. but. Uh, Two-toed sloths and three-toed sloths actually have ranges of vertebrae in each species, so going between basically five and seven in one and eight and nine in the other. Why that is is actually sort of a mystery of uh, evolutionary biology, which is the field that mm -hmm. I work in. That's right. All right, nice work. Wow, we've really had a, uh, a big pull ahead by a few people here in these lightning rounds. 
All right, Horatio, you're yes. up last. Are you ready? Here I am. All right, here we go. Hit him. In Tanzania, <laughs> what is the dish called? Uji, a delicacy made from, oh, who made this? A delicacy made from rain frogs, a thick staple food made from maize flour, meat kebab sold on the market, or a thin millet porridge? I'll give you an answer. It's not a rain frog dish. Thank you for that. Yeah, you are. Um, <clears throat> just insulting. I'm thinking something with fish, but I don't see any fish here. So. <laughs> All right, probably not that. Let's go for the number four, a thin millet porridge. A thin millet porridge. Nice Good one. job. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All of our players for not Good. frogs to that. I appreciate that. All right. I want to guess. Eh? Next up. Here we go. If you took a seat on a bench next to this statue of John Lennon, where in the world would you be? Guayaquil, Ecuador, Havana, Cuba, uh, Rishikesh, India, or Cape Town, South Africa? Where is the statue of John Lennon? Where is the statue? Hmm. I may say Cape Town, South Africa, but I don't see any. I mean, Cuba. Oh, wow. Um, wow. A lot of people got that right. I'm impressed. That was, uh, <laughs> I've never seen that statue. That was a new one to me. All right, here we go. This is a Holbrook uh, related question, actually. <laughs> Approximately what percentage of Costa Rica lands are protected through both public and private reserves? Is it 1%, 5%, 12%, or 25%? Uh, I'm pretty sure that it's a lot. Uh, I would say, wow. Okay. Oh, there you go. It is a lot. You're right. Good job. Yeah. <laughs> You're kind of close, oh, close over. Those... Where is the clock there? <laughs> Everybody just was eager on that one. Holbrook's the the Verde Lodge um, protects, you know, me, like many of the private reserves, it protects 500 acres of rainforest in Costa Rica. To be exactly, it's around 27%. 27, uh, even sure. more. So you were right, Horatio. Yes. The most, whatever the most was. Here, you got it. Now I finally put together, Dave, that the reason the clock sometimes runs out that quickly is because everyone has answered. Right. Oh. So oh. if everyone has answered, then they leave Horatio in the dust here or whoever. You've got to beat, you've gotta beat <laughs> people at home. Right? Got to beat yeah. those people at home. Oh, my gosh. Two more, two more yeah. chances here. This is, this is, actually, this is a fun one. I don't even know how this is true, this one. One in 10 Icelanders will accomplish which of these feats during the Iceland? So one in 10 people, will they be elected mayor, publish a book, own a car, or record a music album? I say elected mayor. Elected mayor. I feel like there's probably more people than that in Iceland, but maybe there's not that many people. <laughs> other, other guesses? Publish a book. Wow. One in 10 people in Iceland publish a book. It's wow. amazing. What I actually was, it? my guess was record a music album, but. What right. do the other nine do? <laughs> book. It's a great, it's a very literate audience. So there you go. All right, your last question. This is our last question of the lightning rounds. Yes. Where in the world can you find the largest tropical wetland? Is it the Pantanal in Brazil? The Zapata Swamp in Cuba, the Everglades in Florida, or the Okavango Delta in Botswana? I go for the Pantanal in Brazil, but I'm not sure. I'm guessing. it. That was a quick answer. And you are correct. Yeah. Woohoo! Good, good one. The Pantanal in Brazil is the world's largest tropical wetland ecosystem. Nice work. All right. Good job, panelists. Good job, everybody at home. That was a lot of fun. Thank you. All right, the third prize goes to Phil. The second prize goes to Cad. Um, and the first prize goes to Adam. Woo! Yay. Fabulous. Yay. <laughs> Sarah was in the lead there for a while. Uh, but good job, um, Adam and Phil and, and Cad. I have a feeling that's probably initials. Um, that's so, Kevin. Okay, Kevin, good I job. Uh, fabulous. Thank you so much to all of you uh, for playing.
Um, and what we're going to do, and I, I know through your registrations that we have your addresses um, uh, and we will be sending you our prizes. So for our third prize winner, we're actually going to be um, sending you a wonderful book. I hope you haven't read it. If you have, you might want to gift it to someone. Um, I actually met this author uh, at the Florida Museum of Natural History during one of their special guest lectures. It was The Invention of Nature, Andrea Wolf. So you'll get um, a copy of The Invention of Nature. Hope you that is a that. really good book. For reference, anybody should read it. It's a book actually about Alexander von Humboldt, who is a famous German who really sort of invented uh, a lot of how we see the world today in terms of ecology and uh, evolution. Very yeah. Good. I really, really enjoyed it and loved um, that the museum brought her here to Gainesville so I could meet her. So that was really fun. Um, and second prize, we have a um, basket of goodies of things from all over, um, you know, Holbrook destinations, um, including a really nice box of alfajores from Argentina and other goodies. Um, and first prize is a, a slightly bigger basket uh, that includes a Holbrook t-shirt. So thank you so much to our players uh, for joining us and to all of you who played along. Um, and um, yes, so I think what we can do now um, is, and by the way, uh, if you don't mind putting in the chat what size t-shirt you would like the best. Um, so small, medium, large, or I think extra, extra large as well. Um, so um, white, I think right now, what I just wanna do is, um, before I turn it over to Lindsay, just to um, first of all, thank our panelists. I know this, this, um, really, really appreciate, Dave, um, you're uh, taking this on and volunteering with us to help support our uh, guides um, and to Horacio and Felipe and Andrea uh, from Ecuador, Costa Rica, Argentina. Uh, really, really uh, wonderful. And we were so lucky that we didn't have any interruptions with internet or any snafus. Um, so, uh, and really appreciate that. And uh, for those of you who, who played or who just watched along, um, uh, thank you for joining us. And we really hope uh, very soon after our webinar, we will be sending you an email uh, that will have a link to donate. Um, so we, we certainly appreciate your donation uh, towards this fund. And um, for some of you that might be group leaders that have led uh, trips with Holbrook and uh, might have participants that have joined you in the past, if you wanted to share the link with others that you know uh, would uh, you know, perhaps like the opportunity to, um, to support um, our guides in 15 countries um, that are currently without work due to, to the pandemic. Every penny, of course, uh, goes to them. Um, and um, so we, we certainly appreciate you handing, sharing that link with any, anybody that you think might be interested in, in participating. Okay, so Lindsay, do you wanna wrap it up now? I will wrap it up. So um, yeah, as Andrea said, um, we'll be sending out uh, an email immediately after uh, we end the webinar today with uh, links. So if anyone, um, again, if you um, feel inspired to uh, donate to the guide fund, obviously um, it's for a good cause and all donations will go directly to the guides. Um, and just to reiterate what Andrea said, um, obviously everything was possible today thanks to the generosity of our hosts and our panelists. Uh, Dave, Andrea, Felipe, and Horacio. So thank you so much to all four of you. It was so much fun, uh, just a really fun time and uh, enjoyed it a lot. Um, they've all been so kind and generous with their time to make this event a success. So we're very thankful to them for that. Um, and then lastly, I'll make one more quick announcement. Uh, we have another fundraising initiative coming up to benefit our guides. Andrea mentioned this at the beginning. Um, normally each year we put out our Holbrook calendar with photos taken by our travelers. Uh, obviously this year is a little different and unfortunately um, we've not been able to travel, but we are still doing a calendar this year using traveler photos from years past. Um, and this year we will be asking for a donation uh, to go towards the, gu the guide fund. Um, so we will be sending out more information about that and taking orders for those soon. 
uh, you might want one for yourself. They make a great gift. And again, it's all for a good cause. So um, you can look out for the information, both for the, the guide fund donation link, uh, the recording of today's webinar, and then also the uh, calendar information. Uh, all of that will be coming to you soon. So uh, again, thank you again so much for playing with us today. We had a lot of fun. We hope you had a lot of fun as well. And uh, we're just so thankful that you uh, spent part of your day with us. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thank, thank you. you, everybody. Thank you very Bye. much. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank Bye. you. Bye.